Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain Beyond the horizon Mercy for today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And it's why I sing your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips Will you father the orphan? Your kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own You're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt Rid of all her shame Known by her true it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You will be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord, you will be praised, you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord, you will be praised. Be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy are you, Lord? And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips Welcome to Eastside Church. So glad that you've joined us, whether this is your very first time or uh, you just regularly join us. Glad you're here. Uh, I'm always kind of amazed by churches, gatherings of believers who come, uh, come together to encourage one another to worship Him. But what always kind of blows my mind is just how we all come from such different places and so I know many of you have been working right through this coronavirus the whole time and and you may actually um, be at a place where you're it's almost just your new normal and you go to work in the midst of this and here's what it looks like and and then there's others of us who have been shut in for a long time and um, in some ways dying to get back out 
uh, just because we, we can feel isolated and, and miss people. And then this week, there's been many who have actually gone back to work for the first time. And that's brought on a, probably a bunch of different emotions. Happy to see some people, uh, also afraid of what risks are there that um, this is all new again. And what I like about church and even the opportunity to be up in front of you is when I think of all the different places we're all coming from, it really puts me at God's mercy um, and to know what to say because we're all coming from such different places. But what I'd like to encourage you as you gather here is God knows exactly where you're coming from and what's burdening you today. And he knows how to encourage you. So I trust that he'll use this service to encourage you. And maybe the best way to encourage you is to just lead us into a practice that we do every service, which is to confess our sins. And I lead you in to this and, and say this is encouraging because at the end, I'm going to remind us all of 1 John 1, 9, that when we confess, we are forgiven. Otherwise, confession might not be that encouraging. You just think of all your mistakes throughout the week. But that's not what it's about. Certainly, we want to acknowledge where we misstepped and we want to get right with him, that we can worship him and, and be encouraged and encourage those around us. Um, but the reason we can come to him and confess and, and come out on the other side clean and encouraged is because Jesus Christ gave himself up for us because he loves us. So why don't we just spend a few moments quietly confessing any missteps we might have had this week, uh, any words that were spoken that shouldn't have been spoken, or, or actions that we should have taken and we didn't because we were afraid, whatever it might be, that we can confess our sin now quietly. And then in a little bit, I'll... I'll go ahead and remind us again that when we confess, we're forgiven. Would you please spend a few moments of silence confessing our sins to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, Please forgive us. Forgive us for forgetting that you are on the throne and that you have rescued us out of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light, your kingdom, the kingdom of your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, forgiveness. Forgive us and thank you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now forgiven and free, purified from all unrighteousness. Would you please uh, join uh, together in worshiping him as Reed leads us.
good and we are going to praise him and we are also going to in our efforts to praise him uh, besides seeing out truth uh, we're we're gonna look to see his will done in our lives and so we're gonna pray the Lord's Prayer like we do every week and ask that his will would be done on earth in our lives as it is in heaven. Would you please uh, pray with me as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We say pretty regularly around here that we're all learning to pray that we're in this process of learning to pray. And, and that's one of the reasons that we make sure we say the Lord's Prayer every week is that we would continue to grow 
in our practice of prayer and even be thinking through the model prayer that Jesus gave us. Um, another way, though, that we learn to pray is we gather during the week to pray. And I have a new friend who joins us for um, prayer during the week. Uh, even though she lives in North Carolina, her name is Mayanna Dobbins, and she's going to share a short testimony on how God has blessed her um, during these morning prayer times, even though she's in a different state. So here's Mayanna. Hi, Eastside. I'm Mayanna Dobbins, and my husband and I live in Apex, North Carolina, and also in Williamsburg. We're back and forth, but praying God will show us where he wants our permanent home to be. I'm here to share with you how much the morning prayer time has meant to me. The Lord blessed me so greatly through Karen when she encouraged us one Sunday to dial in to the prayer meeting and told us we didn't have to say anything. Just come and be blessed. And what a blessing it is. I'd like to encourage you to come also. I feel a connection with each person on the call, even though I've never met them. Our connection is Jesus. We love him. You'll be blessed as I am by the scriptures read and by the prayers offered. We are all walking a different path and the Holy Spirit is teaching us different things. And it is so beautiful to listen to people reading scripture the Spirit has put on their hearts to read such a balm to my heart and gives me strength for, the, for another day. For me personally, this has been the best and biggest gift during this time of quarantine. And isn't it just like God to give us beauty in the ashes? I'd like to read a scripture that was shared this morning, Colossians 3, 14 through 17. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. At this point in our service, we'd be passing the plates um, and, and giving announcements. And so um, as far as giving goes, if you want to know how you can give, please go to our website and go to the bottom of the home page and you'll see a little button there, giving, you can hit that and it'll tell you how you can give through the mail or online or um, I think all your questions can be answered there. Um, as far as announcements go, uh, you heard Karen mention last week and by the way, Karen uh, right now isn't doing any pieces of the um, service because she's gone back to work so she really isn't as available as she was. But as she goes back to work and others go back to work this week, it is a um, just kind of has brought to the forefront questions to Eastside about, okay, how do we start gathering again? What does that look like? We're in this phase one. Um, so it was mentioned last week to keep looking at the website and we'll keep uh, talking about it here too. But I did have a, a couple thoughts. Um, one is, we'd like to just put it on your schedule tentatively. I look forward to hearing more input too and more details to follow, but June 3rd is a Wednesday night, as a Wednesday, and uh, thinking about doing an outdoor service, weather permitting, in the parking lot where we just continue our Daniel Bible study, which we've been putting on the website on Wednesday nights. Anyhow, so at that point, June 3rd, I think we'd be on Daniel chapter 6, which is Daniel in the lion's den, a uh, pretty, pretty famous story. Um, and, and just thinking, okay, let's, let's try gathering there because our Wednesday night gathering is so much smaller than anything we might do on Sunday morning. So 
put that at least tentatively on your radar and I think it's kind of drive up take up these parking spots and we'll we'll see how we might be able to do it and you know start small start today as far as time goes I wouldn't mind hearing your input on what time works best for you but uh, we'll get more details on that next week so that's not this Wednesday but the following Wednesday and then also what I'd love to hear from you on is um, really thinking about gathering in neighborhoods just small gatherings where for instance we have quite a few people from Queens Lake uh, is there someone who has a yard at Queens Lake where you could say, yeah, we could easily sit 10 or 12 people and spread out chairs. Maybe we even bring our own chairs like a Little League game. You know, you bring those fold up chairs and that way you don't have to worry about anybody. <laughs> is it clean or whatever? Um, but just in the very beginning stages of thinking about that. But if you have a yard where you think, hey, we can gather here, um, then please uh, text me or email me. Uh, we can put uh, my phone number and email up on the screen right now and you can, you can call or text or email me. And I'd love to hear, like, is that a possibility and what might that look like? And again, beginning stages and we can decide what all the details are as we keep moving forward. But I'd love to include you all in this process you know when we're thinking about where is God leading us as a church sometimes the next step is obvious and only the next step is obvious and you take it you just take it but I find that also especially when I'm looking in Scripture uh, what's happening is the church is asking what is God already doing and maybe we want to just move into what he's already doing. And so I love to gather people or, or grab people and say, will you give a testimony and share a little bit about what God is doing in your life? And so we all get to hear how is God moving amongst us because he is moving. He is not quarantined. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you, uh, Norman Tessier, who is who is on our leadership team here at Eastside, and hear from him on how God's moving in his life. Here's Norman. The Lord put on my heart during this pandemic that it is a time to hide. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, it does not mean that I could go down in my crawl space and wrap myself in a blanket with all my cans of food and my can opener and water and hide. It does mean, however, that I need to hide in my heart, hide in his heart. I need to let the Lord, this is for me, let the Lord speak to me, humble myself. Don't think about casting judgments on what's going on, but know that the Lord is behind all of this. He is tearing down things. He is building up things. It is a time to be humble. So, two mornings in a row, the Lord put on my heart that you are my hiding place. I'm going to read out of Psalm 32, 6 through 8, but the whole psalm is good. 6 through 8 say, Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are my hiding place. You do preserve me from trouble. You do surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. As I was contemplating what I was going to say and thinking about hiding, I was in a different room in the house and I felt like I wanted to think about a cave because that's a good place to hide. And then I thought about David who hid in a cave. And then I remembered the name of the cave was Adullam. 
So I felt like the Lord wanted me to look up that word, Adullam. And the first thing I saw when I looked up the word was a hiding place. David was anointed king already. David was now hiding in a cave. And for what purpose? Well, God was still working out him being king. And even though he had a vision for that, he needed to be hiding because God wasn't done preparing the way for him. So as we walk through these days, God is preparing for his son, Jesus Christ, to return and rule and reign. He is judging sin. So therefore, part of my hiding is confessing my sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive me of my, all my sins. He is so merciful and so ready. We don't need to think that he'll be ashamed of us. He is waiting for us to do that. And he's waiting to change our hearts. I'm going to read a song. And the song is, You Are My Hiding Place. It goes like this. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. We can be hiding in him. An interesting thing happened to me this past few days. Uh, two years ago was when I first got the nerve up to talk to somebody, a stranger. And it was his birthday coming up. I went and got him a birthday card so that when I saw him next, I could give it to him. Well, he got laid off from his job washing cars where I had met him. As it turned out, two days ago, we were walking down near the car dealership, but kind of in a wooded part, in a curvy part of the street that we walked down. And all of a sudden he popped out of the woods, the same person, my friend. And I'd seen him a lot lately. He had had times of drawing away from me, kind of avoiding. And now he is being more and more open. And there he was going to uh, his sister's house because it was his birthday. So that's how I know it was two years ago. And the neat thing was we've been having conversations. He's actually been at the East Side Church and he talked about it. Well, I can bring my questions here. And one day I told him Psalm 91 is a good Psalm to read during this time. And he said, I've been reading the scriptures and I'm going to read that. I'm going to read that Psalm. And so it's just really neat how God is gently leading this gentleman. And he gently leads us all, and he gently led me into being more open and praying that God would use me any way he would like. So even though it's time to hide, it's also time to be out and about as God leads, as we follow the directions we've been given during this time. He is the lover of our souls. He does things to draw us to him and to me. This is a time to hide in him, to hide in the secret place of the Most High. Thank you, Norman. Your commitment to listening for Jesus' voice and then following him as he leads you is an encouragement and a challenge to me. So thank you, and I know to many others too. So thank you. At this time, we're gonna transition our service to that, that part where the students share some of what they're learning. And, and oftentimes that's a memory verse. Uh, they recite the memory verse for the week. Uh, and then other times it's they share their, their SOAP, which is our Bible devotion, S-O-A-P, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. This week, we're actually going to save all the memory verses that we got for next week. So we'll be playing Matthew 5, 3 memory verses next week, as well as whatever verses we receive for next week, which the memory verse is Matthew 5, 4. So 5, 3 this week, 5, 4 next week. But we'll play them both next week. 
as we begin to learn, uh, memorize the Beatitudes. But what we're doing this week is uh, a soap that Dominic actually did for us, and we played back on Easter uh, from Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. So I'm going to read Acts 16, 6 through 10, so that you'll have the background or the context from which Dominic's soap uh, came from, but also so that we continue to get a feel for the whole book of Acts as we're moving through the book of Acts as these different ways that uh, Luke is organizing Acts so that we can keep it straight in our minds. And, and one of the things he does is he uses uh, geography in a way that can help us organize Acts. So that Acts chapter 13 and 14, that's Paul's first missionary journey, where we saw that among other places, he went through Galatia. And then in Acts chapter 15, there was a dispute, and then they all went to Jerusalem to resolve the dispute. So chapter 15 is really Acts, the church in Jerusalem. And in chapter 16, we begin Paul's second missionary journey. So this is Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. It's like, don't go here, go here. <laughs> when they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Again, don't go here, go here. So they passed Mycia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And as I was reading and you were seeing that marker move along that map, you get an idea for how much hard work must have been going into these trips. These are long trips without cars and airplanes. Now we're going to go ahead and have Dominic share his soap from this passage. My soap was on the verses, Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. The scripture I chose was Acts 16, verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. My observation was, this verse stood out to me because of how quick Paul and the people with him decided to go to Macedonia. They truly believed in what they needed to do and that God was calling them there. My application was, in our lives, we usually don't jump right in to a plan that involves traveling to an unknown country or anything that has a risk. We should have more faith in God and listen to what he wants us to do. My prayer was, Lord, Strengthen us as we carry out your will, and give us courage to help others as they too are being moved by you. Amen. Thank you, Dominic. Now, our passage for today that our sermon will be grounded in is from Acts 16, verses 22 through 34. And we're going to pick up uh, at a place where Paul um, and his friend, um, specifically Silas, have encountered some more difficulty as they moved over into Macedonia. And we'll pick it up as the crowd turns on them. So this is verse 22 verse through verse 34. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten after they had been severely flogged. They were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, 
He put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. This is the word of the Lord. Right before the coronavirus quarantine began, we were gathered in the foyer to pray. It was a Saturday prayer. I don't know if it was the, the last Saturday we gathered to pray or the second to last one, but it was right in there. And I can remember my friend Grace, who it is always a pleasure to pray with. She prays so fervently. Uh, but she um, was gathered with us to pray. And, and when we pray and gather, we always encourage people also to share the scripture that God put on their heart. That the prayers can uh, be grounded in the scripture or just be the scripture itself. And I remember that what Grace read, the scripture she read, during that time we were circled up and praying, about 20 of us, was the passage that I just read there, as Acts 16, right around 22 to 34. I don't remember exactly, but it's pretty close to exactly those verses. And I remember when she read it, uh, I remember two things. One is I remember thinking, I can't wait till we get to Acts 16 so I can talk about it. What a great passage. But what stood out to me so much that Saturday was that I was preaching on Acts chapter 8 and they were so similar. <laughs> it, it is like, in some ways, um, just a repeat of chapter 8 with different characters. And I'll, I'll pick that up again near the end of the service. But what hit me was if, if Luke feels like he needs to repeat this message, uh, the one that he kind of gave to us in chapter eight, and now is giving to us again in chapter 16, then um, I'll be sure to repeat it too. Uh, if Luke thinks it's important enough, then, then I'm with him. <laughs> and I think one of the questions that Luke's answering for us in chapter 8 and in chapter 16 here is what do we expect? What are we expecting? That as we, as we listen to Jesus' voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit um, that we picked up on right in six verses six through ten and right before we went into Dominic's soap just how the Holy Spirit was leading here that the Holy Spirit said hey don't go here go here the Spirit of Christ said don't go here go here and by the way that's just 
two different ways to say the same thing. Um, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ lives in us and he leads us. So what are we expecting when we follow exactly what God's calling us to do? And one of the things mentioned when we were reading verses 6 through 10, and we saw that map was, I think what we can expect as we follow is um, expect hard work, that there's an effort required to follow Jesus. That when Jesus said, whoever comes after me must take up their cross and follow me, he wasn't he wasn't kidding. I mean, it's a, a metaphor, but a, a metaphor to help us understand this is hard work. This requires discipline. This, this means doing things we don't want to do, at least not all of us, that we don't see the immediate benefit. We can see the long-term benefit, and so it's hard, so do it. It's, expect hard work as we follow. But what really stood out to me is what we can expect in addition to the hard work. That I don't want to make light of that. It is hard work and requires discipline. And, and that's why we're constantly trying to encourage one another, because it's hard. So expect hard work, but also power. Power. That what we see in Acts chapter 16, you know, the reason there was a, a riot to begin with was because Paul had cast a, a demon out of this young girl that was harassing him. Like through this young girl, this demon was harassing Paul. And so he finally just turned and, uh, you know, kicks the demon right out of her. It just delivers her. The problem was because of this demon, this, this girl had had powers to predict the future, or at least to some degree, and, and the owners of this girl were making money on her. And so uh, they were upset and they started this riot. But power shows up as Paul's obeying the leading of Jesus Christ. That expect hard work, but also power. And it's not the last time we see power showing up in chapter 16, that when Paul's arrested and treated harshly, right, put in the inner cell and shackled, and but an earthquake comes and just sets him free, that the power of God shows up as Paul puts in this effort, this discipline, this hard work that's required, expect hard work, yes, but also power. And then we see God's power on display again when the jailer does what? He's about to kill himself. But Paul says, don't, we're all still here. And when he realizes he, they might not have escaped, they might have stayed, he just comes rushing into Paul's cell and says, what must I do to be saved? That is also a display of power, right? When we see repentance in a man's life like this, this was a man who had just treated Paul Harshly, putting him in the cell, shackle him. You know, all he had to do was hold on to him. Did he really have to put him in this inner cell and shackle him? It seems harsh. This man is repentant, on his knees, humble. What must I do to be saved? And what must he do? Believe in Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Put your trust in him. Don't put your trust in Rome or in money or in anything else. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe and you'll be saved. I mean, the power of God is all over chapter 16. By the way, that's just like chapter 8. And for those of you who don't remember chapter 8, it was a couple months ago. But this was Philip. This was Philip after Stephen had been stoned, his friend in chapter 7, being sent out into Samaria. And as he went out into Samaria, no doubt still mourning the loss of his friend Stephen. And mourning that he, he he's leaving the place that he was living. You know, he's been uh, persecuted and he's had to flee from Jerusalem. But he goes into Samaria now and continues to preach the gospel. He's, 
He's sacrificing. He has suffered in obeying Jesus' voice. But what happens when he gets there? Miracles. Power shows up. And the Samaritans believe. And the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Samaria. It actually shouldn't surprise us that power shows up, but when it does, the power of God shows up, it is startling still. But it shouldn't be a surprise in that Jesus told us this is what's going to happen. In Luke 24, verse 39, he says, You'll be clothed in power. In Acts 1, verse 8, he says, Wait here in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Power. Power from on high to go make disciples in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. When we follow Jesus' voice, expect hard work, sacrifice, even suffering, but also power. One Wednesday night when we were in the youth group, uh, here at Eastside when we were still allowed to gather. I remember uh, one of the students' parents came and she was distraught because her eyes um, were going through illness. And she was concerned if she was going to be able to see uh, 2020 ever again. And the doctors had assured her that your eyes will never be the same. and. Um, what she asked for then was prayer. And so we gathered to pray. And I'm going to let her one day, when I can talk her into it, share all the details. And I'll tell you that the miracle is still in process. But when we gather to pray, it's almost difficult to believe, right, that God can really heal entirely. But that's what we asked for. Because here we are as a church, as a people, following Jesus' voice. And while we can expect hard work, we can also expect power. Lord, will you show up in power and do what the doctors say can't be done? And I want to tell you that his power has showed up. And she has already progressed well beyond what they said she would get to. And um, I hope to have more details in that story in the near future. But as we follow Jesus' voice, expect hard work, but also expect power. Well, as my friend Grace was reading this passage, Acts 16, at that prayer meeting a couple months ago, there was another piece that stood out to me even more so than the hard work and the power that connected back to chapter 8, that where Philip went into Samaria, and as he moves into it, he's got to still be in mourning, right? We heard in chapter 7 they were mourning. They mourned greatly over the loss of Stephen, their friend, who had been stoned. Right? So now Philip moves into Samaria with power, but as he does and the Samaritans come to faith, what we read at the end of that story where the Samaritans come to faith at the beginning of chapter 8 is they experienced joy. And then Grace read this passage, that prayer meeting from Acts 16. And Paul, amidst all this hard work and suffering, just like Philip was going through, he comes in power in Jesus' name. And we get these miracles and, and healings and, and power. And people are turning and believing the power of God to change lives. And then what? What does this, joy or, this, joy, this jailer have at the end? I just gave it away. Joy. Joy. That as we follow Jesus' voice, we can expect hard work, but also power and joy. That the jailer repents and finds joy. That while Paul and Silas were in jail, suffering as they followed, what are they doing? Praying and singing hymns. Joy. 
that there is a joy in the midst of suffering as we follow after Christ, in the midst of this hard work, in discipline, in this delayed gratification as we follow after Jesus sometimes, right? Jesus always had joy, but it wasn't like he was always joyful. It, it, it's like this. Jesus said, um, my peace I give to you, and I don't give to you as the world gives. He also said, my joy will be in you. And it's the same idea. He, he doesn't give as the world gives. That when we get some sort of peace for something temporary that the world has, uh, offers us, whether it's money or fame or power or anything from the world, it's, it's temporary. That's how the world gives. It's a temporary giving. It doesn't last. But what Jesus gives lasts forever. So that Jesus is, how Jesus is described in Hebrews is that he, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So that here he is on the cross. And it's not like he's just straight up rejoicing up there. He's suffering. But his joy is not gone. The promise is still in place. The joy is still before him. And it's the same for us. That even in our worst moments, the joy that Jesus has given us, it's not gone, it's out there. And then what we also get in this life is we get joy just exploding into our lives. So that there's moments when we're just so aware of what the joy of the Lord is, we are experiencing it. I'm going to put a picture up right now that you can see. Uh, and this was a year ago, May 19th. So my daughter just experienced her first anniversary with her husband, Brody. And I want to tell you that that picture, that day, was just a profound joy that God just poured out on me and on others. Just this joy that comes in following him. One of the things that brought great joy is that I know I've made mistakes as a parent, that I've said words that I wasn't supposed to say, that I've done things that I, I shouldn't have done or maybe didn't do things that I should have done. I've made mistakes and sometimes I'm incredibly aware of it. I think, oh Lord, forgive me and, and please be with my daughter. <laughs> like, save her. Let her know your love, which is just perfect love, unlike my imperfect love and and that day was such a reminder that Jesus comes in power and answers prayer he, he he doesn't always answer how we want that's for sure you know that even Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said if you if you can take take this cup away right I don't want to go through the cross but if it has to be father then your way and sometimes it's like that, right? We'd rather something be removed, but sometimes he just comes right in and displays his power in that instant. And on that day, there was just so much joy that he had answered that prayer in power. There's joy. That we can expect hard work, but also power and joy. That when Paul and Silas are severely beaten, even then the joy isn't gone. That there's still a joy out in front of them. That they're in jail and it's like the Holy Spirit has so refreshed them that they could still sing hymns and pray and joy. He brings joy. What we're told after that Hebrews passage where it says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He experiences resurrection, right? It says then he sits down at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy, complete joy. And then it tells us, consider this. 
consider the opposition that Jesus faced from sinful men so that we do not lose heart and give up. That as we might be moving through really difficult times right now for some of us, I want to encourage you, don't give up. The joy isn't gone. That as you follow Jesus Christ, it, it might feel like you're going right through the cross right now, but that joy is still set before you. That you still got it. It's not like how the world gives, where there's no hope. And all your joy can literally, if you're counting on the world, disappear and be gone forever. There's just no answers to how badly our life can fall apart when we're counting on just the world, on a life apart from Jesus. But Jesus Christ offers power and joy, joy that can't be taken away. Please keep going, keep following. And for those of you who are experiencing just the joy of the Lord even in this moment, then look around and see who God might be putting in your path that you might be able to encourage. Give a phone call or write a note. Remind each other that while we listen to Jesus' voice, we can certainly expect hard work, discipline, even suffering, delayed gratification sometimes but also power and joy. We're going to now continue our worshiping in song. Even when I don't see it, you're working. 
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. He is the way maker and the miracle worker for our benediction. I'm going to read Revelation uh, chapter 21 verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Joy. Jesus is going to come back and bring heaven and earth together and set everything right. He is going to judge evil, wipe away every tear, no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Yes, we can expect hard work, but also power and joy and joy forever. Have a wonderful week.